There's one other power that I want to show you, which I think you want to treat differently from all others. And it's a very common occurrence that you will get a square root on the bottom. So 3 over square root of x dx. Let me first do it the same way, and then I'll do it the way I actually do it. So there is a tendency to try to stick to one way of doing things. The way that works, that's robust, always gives you the right answer, and you just rely on it. So if you want to rely on that, let's do it your way first. And that would be to realize that square root means that it's x to the power one-half. And so if you write it in the numerator, it becomes x to the power minus one-half. All of that happens in your head. So then adding 1 to the power, you realize that this is coming from x to the 1 half. Okay, great. Now you're done with the power. You can forget about the power. It's correct. Just worry about the coefficient. And so what happens? I'm now mentally differentiating this, and this makes me realize that 1 half comes down. But I don't want 1 half. I want 1. So to make up for it, I would need to put in a 2. And now I remember about the 3, so it just becomes 3 times 2, 6, times, not times, plus C. Okay? Okay. However, that's not how I do this integral. I remember, because square root of x is a special enough function that it deserves a slot in your brain. I remember that the derivative of square root of x is 1 over twice square root of x. Yes, this is a special case of the power law, because the square root of x is x to the 1 half. And so the derivative is 1 half times x to the minus 1 half, which means that it's on the bottom and it's, that it's under the square root. And yes, it's a special case of the power law but it's a special enough special case that I remember it outright. And when I see 1 over square root of x, I recognize it as having come from the square root of x. You guys are with me on that? So my eye sees this and immediately thinks this came from the square root of x because that's what the derivative does to the square root of x. It puts it on the bottom. So you should add this to the table of derivatives that's in your head. And it's true that sometimes I advocate against making these tables bigger. And that's why I want you to forget about secants and cosecants. Because why have more functions when we, we could, when we can have fewer functions? And you could say by the same token, why have more identities that we need to memorize if we can memorize fewer identities? And that's valid enough, but the square root of x it appears so frequently in practice that it deserves a special place in your brain. So the way I would think about this we're taking a fresh look at the same integral. So my brain sees the square root of x on the bottom and it immediately triggers this formula. I know that this came from the square root of x. But I also know that the square root of x produces 2 times square root of x on the bottom. So sometimes mentally, or if the problem is larger, I do it literally. I put a 2 on the bottom just to make it exactly the derivative of square root of x. For something this simple, I'll imagine it. For something more complicated, I'll literally do this. But you can't just put a 2 in the denominator. So I make up for it by also putting a 2 in the numerator. And so now the expression is equivalent to what we started out with, except I see this now as a straight multiple of the exact derivative of the square root of x. So there is nothing left to do. I'm looking at the derivative of the square root of x times 6. That's all I have left. What I have left here is literally 6 times the derivative of something that I know. And so the answer is 6 square root of x. And this could be radically different from the way you're used to thinking about this, but give it a shot. 
There are lots of square root of x's in this course in Monday exercises. You will see that this is a very good way of thinking about it. Yeah. It's a very nice trick to throw in two opposite things, which makes which gives you a new expression that's equivalent to the original expression, but now has new structure that you can take advantage of. So what I'm doing here is multiplying the top and the bottom by 2. I can do that with any fraction. If I have a fraction, I can multiply the numerator and the denominator by 2. And that's what I did. And from a certain point of view, it's, let's say, meaningless, because it leaves it, it, leaves it unchanged from the point of view of what its value is. But it's very changed from the point of view of what it looks like. So what, I'm about, so what I'm about to do is perform the legal operation of multiplying the numerator and the denominator by 2. Multiply the numerator by 2. Multiply the denominator by 2. So I left the problem unchanged. Except now, lo and behold, what I see here is a function that I recognize from my table of derivatives. It is precisely the derivative of the square root of x. And so the antiderivative of the portion in the shape is just square root of x times the factor of 6 that I just have sitting there. So it's 6 times the square root of x.